what a crowd. Uh, Caitlin, where are you? What a lack of coincidence uh, around this turnout tonight uh, for our Montag lecture. Um, so welcome, everybody. Uh, we are thrilled you're here, and uh, from so many different places, um, where we're all committed to the same goal around the chance for every child in Georgia uh, to have, have the chance to, to be his best self um, for a lifetime. And so I want to start with the thanks that the person who has taken on that stewardship for our state's children is our lecturer tonight. Um, Dr. Caitlin Dooley is our Deputy Superintendent for the Department of Education responsible for teaching and learning all 130,000 children born in Georgia each year. And um, in combination with the stewardship of a singular commitment by Governor Deal and Mrs. Deal that every child in Georgia um, should have the capacity to read proficiently and choose a life of self-determination. And so um, one person might view this as a responsibility and limit it to that. Um, Caitlin, as a public service, demonstrates every day the privilege of the opportunity to make this kind of impact. So for us tonight, as I said in a dinner ahead of time, uh, we're here to hear from Caitlin, but we're also here uh, to honor her as well. Um, and we're grateful that we can honor Caitlin, as this is our 20th Montag Lecture Series lecture. And so I want to thank Tony and Jackie Montag for their generosity in making this possible. This would be the time for loud applause. Yeah, all right. And those whoops were also appreciated uh, as well. So I thought um, to give context for the evening, um, Caitlin cannot accept a gift over $25 in value. Um, so, we have met the mark and have created a gift under $25 for Caitlin. So, Caitlin, I just want you to come up. If you don't mind coming up and opening this first, and then we're going to have about 10 minutes of introduction. But if Caitlin can open this, and then we can explain um, context for the gift. Oh, God. But don't look at her. Can you all talk while she's <laughs> opening it? I mean, don't put her on the spot. This feels a lot like Christmas at our house where in our house we have to brag on how much we love every gift? Yes. <laughs> Y'all have that at your house where, you know, it, like my sister and brother-in-law one time bought this horrific, they went to Germany for Christmas and came back with this sweater with this large deer across the front of it <laughs> and thought that somehow that was okay. And it was horrific enough. And then they insisted I try it on. Well, it was two sizes too small. <laughs> So this deer not only was horrible looking, but the deer's nose and backside sort of met each other over here on the other side of my um, sweater. But anyway, I wish I'd kept it. Well, anyway, back, back to Caitlin. Um, there was a, um, there's a ceramic artist um, from England, Claire um, Toomey, who um, created in 2006 4,000 um, blue ceramic birds to have at the Victoria and Albert Museum. And unlike typical exhibits, rather than for people just to stare and admire these birds and works of art, they were each in, people were encouraged to take them with them to spread this message and spread this art and spread this beauty. And so this year, um, our first graders in our Ward Law School studied Claire Toomey and then created their own blue birds not to have and share here, but to take home and share with others uh, in our work with our children. So this is uh, one of those bluebirds done by our art teacher uh, to present to Caitlin. And for us, um, what this represents is a, a thank you to Caitlin um, and a recognition and a purpose to honor her commitment that our goal is that one day very, very soon that all of our children should have the chance to fly. And Caitlin is making that happen, and we're grateful to you. And so some would say that this, in order to meet her government obligation, that this gift costs nothing, um, we would see it very differently and say it's priceless. Can I say 
<laughs> Thanks, Caitlin. All right, so we, yes. So um, I feel like I'm ready to cry because for the last few months, I just moved into a new loft, and I, I am going to cry. Um, I think of my role as holding a bird in the hand because it's, it's hard. It's hard work, and you're constantly having to move with lots of organizations. You'll hear that in my talk. And I think of it as like, I don't know if you guys have seen kung fu movies where they can do that. You know, they can hold a bird in the hand without crushing it. But, you're, but the bird is constantly flying, but they're holding the bird in the hand. And you gave me a bird. <laughs> thank you. No, thank you, Caitlin. So, as, so I wanted to show you, and, and we always at this day take about 10 minutes to talk about the work of the speech school. And our work now, again, in support of, of Caitlin, and we also have Ken Zeff here who directs the Metro Chamber of Commerce's Learn for Life project. And we partner with Caitlin um, and other agencies around what do we do to end our city's illiteracy and state's illiteracy crisis. So our commitment is that for the 2018-19 school year, uh, I think you know our Every Opportunity video has now had almost 100 million views and we are offering the opportunity to, well, we're asking people to partner with us to create as many every opportunity schools in Georgia as possible. Uh, and you'll see what that commitment involves. And we have five original leadership schools who have signed up to be every opportunity schools. Drew Charter School, uh, Westside Atlanta Charter School, Centennial Elementary School, Scott Elementary School, and Usher, Usher Collier Elementary School. And we are thrilled to have the leadership. Uh, the leadership here um, from those schools tonight, and we're really appreciative to have the leadership, all the leadership of Usher Collier School to be with us. The Every Opportunity video was fiction created at Usher Collier School two years ago or 18 months ago. Um, and now you'll have a chance to see um, what's happening at Usher Collier School. Well, that's interesting. If I were really Giuliani, I'd say that was my wife. But anyway, um, you may not remember that. Um, but um, at any rate, we'll show you um, what Usher Collier, by this video, is inviting, in fact, urging that schools around Atlanta, schools across Georgia, and schools across the country join them for the 2018-19 school year to become an every opportunity school. And this is their plea. Hey, Mr. Q. Did you see that? Why would somebody do that? looked at some statistics and we're in the 30318 uh, zip code and in that zip code it showed that 30 percent of the state's prison population was comprised of that one area so that was alarming to me. I think most of us would agree that reading is foundational to overall success in life and we know that there's been plenty of published literature speaking to the fact that we can predict a child's quality of life or what career they'll have or their ability to earn a living wage that can support their families based on their levels of literacy proficiency. The other day I was just talking to one of my parents, just filling out a document. I realized that she has challenges with literacy. I saw that we had a lot of children, especially children of color um, entering into special education. I felt like um, a lot of disproportionality was going on. I felt like it was probably wrong and not the process was not being handled appropriately. So it's very important that these students learn how to read, not only read, but learn how to read well. With the pyramid of intervention, it's thought that most students, at least 80% of the students, should be on grade level or are on grade level. But we find out that that's not the case, it's the exact opposite, that only about 20% of the students are proficient in language and literacy. We found that, you know, science can't happen, math can't happen, social studies can't happen 
without literacy. We have always looked at our testing grades, and it was a grades three, four, and five uh, with our new Georgia milestones. But we found out that these are just patches. And, you know, we're trying to put a Band-Aid on something that could have been healed. Sometimes in the classroom I was discouraged about um, just feeling like I'm not doing what I really want to do with the kids, just different things that were mandated and um, just feeling that pressure. Bye, Ms. McGarrity. Frederick Douglass said, once you learn to read, you'll be forever free. The way it is now, two of the three of us will never be able to really read. It doesn't have to be this way. Again. Yeah. One more time. Yeah. Say it together. Yeah. What word? Yeah. Let's go. When we look back at the crux of the matter, and we've partnered with the uh, Atlanta Street School in Rollins, to feel one of our ills, and one of our ills has been literacy. At Atlanta Speech School, we've been extremely fortunate to inherit a legacy of being grounded in the understanding of reading as a hard science for decades. We've served children in our ward law school for children with dyslexia and other language-based learning disabilities based on the science of lead reading and brain researchers by translating this hard science into best practices for teaching children to read. So through our work of the Rollins Center for Language and Literacy, we're able to kind of fine tune these scientifically based practices that are pervasive throughout our own ward law school and apply them in a practical and generalizable way with partner schools in other settings um, so that we have this critical mass of learners and educators benefiting from the very science that we're implementing every day. Along with the Rollins Center, I think we have found some of those solutions in knowing that there's an exact science to the reading brain. To effectively and consistently approach this work through sort of an interconnected lens, we developed a research-based framework that's inspired by the science of Dr. Marianne Wolf and what she describes as the deep reading brain. The act of becoming a deep reader becomes highly unlikely, if not impossible, without having the know-how to put in place the appropriate interventions and remediation through targeted, explicit, and systematic instruction. We share a common vision for what it is that we want for Usher Collier. In other schools, if kids are constant discipline problems, then they may be suspended. But here, we set up parameters so those students can stay here because ultimately, if they're not here in the building, they can't learn. You never know how that child's evening was. So I try to keep my teachers there at the forefront of that. And we try to feel those needs and know sometimes that acting out is in a direct response to the things that are happening at home. And so we try to give a prescription to those things rather than a uh, consequence to an action. The Chinese symbol for active listening is images that encompass the need for open ears, open eyes, undivided attention, an open mind, and an open heart. Nowhere in it do we find evidence of a closed mouth. Listening isn't about the act of being quiet or silencing children's voices. It's about tuning in to those around us, and when that happens, the result is that being quiet naturally happens. Silence is not the key, um, and they have a lot to say. So it's incumbent upon us as educators to give them that voice, but give them that voice with a rich vocabulary and a way of actually articulating your innermost feelings and your thoughts. And we've now created a voice for those students and it has quelled um, and greatly reduced our discipline referrals. A lot of our students, we can't control how they come to us but we can control what takes place in the time that's given to us, changing their trajectory. The way I feel every day, every day, happy, sometimes mad, and safe, because I got Mr. Parker. Hey Jordan, how 
How you doing? Good. Good. When you come in on a Monday morning after a late weekend, and everybody's smiling and they're like, good morning, good morning, good morning, happy Monday. I think that's important. And you do it to the kids too as they're dragging in. Start small in your classroom and you branch out from there. And you just, you provide people with your ideas, you talk to people and try to get buy-in as much as you can. Take a look at tiny bits, chunks of things that you can do yourself in your classroom. Um, or outside of the classroom, no matter what you are. But you have to know that, you know, you need a team of people with you to believe in the vision that you have. I do think that in any school, the main thing should always be the children, but making the children feel welcome and like they're a family and like they're not a burden. When I feel that like the teacher is knowing that, like, you're doing good, Anthony. It just make me feel good. It made me feel like I'm really getting money, but in another way. And just do what you do authentically. So, yeah. <laughs> make the school worldwide. So just as an, and thank you, um, thank you, to our, what a video y'all y'all created, and our uh, Rollins team, uh, where our K, where's our K through third Rollins team? <laughs> what do y'all do, Yvette, what do you do about shine, you want to give you some shine? <laughs> All right, so um, again, we hope schools across Atlanta will will sign up and join with Usher Collier and Drew and all the other schools um, to keep this promise and to build each child's reading brain. So with that, uh, our first, no pressure, my dad used to have a joke, the punchline was, you got a heck of a big job to do, don't mess it up. So with that, with the person with the biggest job in the room, let's please welcome Dr. Caitlin Dooley. <laughs> Welcome. What a, uh, so you've already seen me cry. I won't do that anymore. <laughs> I'm Caitlin McMunn-Dooley. I am Deputy Superintendent for Georgia's Department of Education. And I was very excited to start there almost three years ago now. Um, I came to Georgia as a professor. Um, I started at Georgia State University. And some of the people in this audience were my students. So um, thank you guys for coming back and listening to me yet again. Um, and hopefully you'll tell people that you liked my classes. Uh, <laughs> but um, I've been working as a professor for the last, I would say, 15 years. And before that, I was um, an instructor at the University of Texas. And so I always say when I get to the Department of Education, I had the luxury of reading and, and thinking and listening for like more than a decade. And, I came into the department and everybody's implementing, implementing, implementing. And so we actually complement each other really, really well because um, I think we're, we're um, learning from research now in a faster rate than ever before. Research used to take 20 years to be put into implementation and we really have to move fast now. So um, without further ado, I'll tell you a little bit about what I'm gonna talk about today which is um, learning literacy for life. And by that, what I mean is that we're not just teaching literacy so that kids can pass a test. We're not just teaching literacy so that kids can, can graduate from high school. We are preparing adults in their childhood stage of life. And so we have to take this on in a, in a way, and you can see by the fact that I cry when I get a bird, um, in a way that is um, it, it, it gives credence to the importance of that. And so we have systems in place, and I'm going to be talking to you today about some of those systems themselves. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to skip this video and come back to it because I'm mindful of our time. Um, uh, at the Department of Education, I'm one of five deputy superintendents. 
I'm basically the chief academic officer. Um, so I oversee all of our teaching and learning. That includes our teacher support and development. For those of you who are teachers in the audience, yes, that means your TAPs and TEKS and LEAPS. Um, curriculum and instruction, which is all the standards, and Georgia Virtual Learning, which we are really trying to innovate with um, within the Georgia Virtual School, as well as really look at what personalized learning means. And I come from a background. <laughs> I had a childhood stage of life, too. The reason why I think of my role at the Department of Education as a system-oriented thing, I think, is because of how I grew up. Um, I'm a military brat. My father was Navy. I've lived, I was born in Pennsylvania, but lived in Naples, Italy, Tel Aviv, Israel, Rhoda, Spain, uh, Jacksonville, Florida, Virginia Beach, Virginia, McLean, Virginia, and my, I went to school in Charlottesville, Virginia. Then I moved uh, back to Virginia Beach, then to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, then to Austin, Texas, and now I've been here for 13 years. So I've had the opportunity to see what different systems look like. So when I got back to Georgia, I was like, oh, this is different. This is not what I saw in Texas or not what I saw in Virginia. And it's kind of like the fish looking at the water in the fishbowl. So what I'm going to try to do today is help you understand what those systems look like and how they relate to a child's literacy learning so that we can better leverage the systems that we have. So I'm going to talk about five key points. Um, I'll talk to you a little bit about children's literacy development, and I think Dr. Ham, you'll be very happy with what I say, because as I was listening, I was like, wow, we're right on the same page. Um, research is really moving fast in this area. I'm going to talk about Georgia's data landscape for literacy learning, so you can kind of see where we are now. And then I'll talk about some of the systems that we have in place that could better our progress. And then I'm going to talk about what the role of the department is in all those systems, because we are working with a lot of organizations to move the system forward. And then I'm going to ask something of you. So first, children's literacy development. Um, at the bottom of all of these, I want to also mention, um, while we know that literacy is um, good for kids, it's also really good for kids because the economic stimulus that comes from having a child who can become literate will pay off in dividends when that child then has, gives birth in their adult stage of life to a new child who doesn't grow up in poverty. And you'll see that our literacy indices are very much overlapped with our poverty levels. And so the more we can tie this full circle together at the community level, the more likely we'll see that we have kids that are growing up in prosperity. So for many years, we've been thinking about developing readers and writers. And, and I am guilty of this. I've been a researcher for 20 years. And we were developing readers and writers. And we talk about emergent literacy. And we were really looking at those micro level skills. What do we need to know in order to become literate? Well, we need to know how to sound out letters. We need to know letter names. We need to know letter sounds. We do. We need to know all of those things. But we, as a, as a country, have spent a lot of money to develop those skills. And yet, what we find is that when we just look at these constrained skills, they kind of peter out over time. Because not many of you are sounding out words anymore. There's so much else that's going on in your reading brain. And believe it or not, your brain started doing that long before you ever hit the classroom. And then it continues to develop all the way into adulthood. And it's amazing to see that progress. That's your comprehension level. So comprehension doesn't grow because of decoding. Comprehension grows because of language ability. So we're now really looking at what language development means in relation to literacy. So this is another really interesting finding. Um, we used to talk about storybook reading all the time and the importance of storybook reading. And then what would happen is, um, People would say, oh, well, while you're reading the story, point out the words on the page and point out the letters in the words. When we compare that to people who are just reading a story and doing the voices like, ho, 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 or, or things like that, and they're actually really doing it in an entertaining way, and I'm looking at our arts, <laughs> our artists here, our um, teaching artists, when you do it in an entertaining way, you're actually 
going to get more bang for your buck in storybook reading than if you point to the letters on the page. And that's amazing that we know that now. So as we're going through all of these um, research findings, we're also learning that text is different now than it's ever been before. We've always had storybooks, we've always had images, we've always had print. What we have now are digital texts which pull those things together more and more often. If any of you have young children, I know that you know, there's all sorts of yes screens or no screens, but I'm pretty much sure that most parents have given their kids the screen, <laughs> right? And, and what we also know, because I've done some work with Between the Lions, do any of you guys know, Between the Lions, Between the co Okay, so what we also know is when you merge media, so when you merge what, um, the, the print and the animation and the, and the image, that you actually can grow reading. Um, for those of you who are researchers in the room, this is the modified simple view of reading. So we're excited about all this, but what does this mean for, for us when we talk about language and literacy development? We have to figure out what is literacy, because it's not just sounding out words on a page. We all know that now. And so we can look at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. This is OECD. This is the organization that does the PISA tests, if any of you look at those. Like when you see, oh, the US was here and Norway was here, this is the test that figures that out, okay? So OECD, OECD actually revised their, their definition of literacy in 2016. You guys probably didn't read that in the news, but I was like, holy cow! They revised their, like, that's, a, that's an amazing, crazy thing. OECD doesn't do that. Like, they don't, it takes them 50 years to come up with consensus on these things. What they did is they, I'm going to read it out loud because um, first they changed from reading to literacy. So suddenly we're looking at production with writing and literacy. Um, re literacy is understanding, evaluating, using, and engaging. They added the word engaging, and we'll come back to that, with written text to participate in society. They added that. That was never there before. Participation in society. To achieve one's goals and to develop one's knowledge and potential. Okay, so we would understand, yes, I've already said, a child in the adult stage of life, they want, we want them to achieve the goal. That's the Frederick. We still want all that. But this whole participate in society, what does that mean? I'm too far? No. Um, there we go. This means that we have a new way of engaging with literacy in today's society. That not just in the US, but in Norway, in Cuba, in Italy, in New Zealand, there are new ways of participating as a literate adult. And this is why we, it's so urgent right now that we think about literacy as participating in society. Because we're seeing literacy actually change. This is a very rudimentary timeline of how literacy is changing here. Um, if you look at this, this kind of cracks me up. So we had Mark Zuckerberg talk in front of Congress, right, with Facebook. Okay, recognize that Facebook was developed 14 years ago. How many of you have 14-year-olds in your house? He'd be in eighth grade right now. Um, we didn't have cell phones like that were active like this, smartphones, until 11 years ago. Now, how, is there anybody in the room that does not have one in your purse or pocket? Uh, <laughs> thank you, Sita. But you have a computer on your lap. <laughs> so. This is, this is a game changer, a game changer, because suddenly we see that there's connectivity and communication in a literate participatory society in a way that we've never seen before. Suddenly we need to produce in a way that we've never seen before. And what's also interesting to me is that our professional organizations are keeping track of this and they're moving at the same direction. So just in case any of you are not familiar, NAEYC, the National Association for the Education of Young Children, the International Literacy Association, zero to three, even the American Academy of Pediatrics has changed their policy position on digital literacies because they're seeing it change how we interact in society and how children have to interact in order to be prepared as adults. 
So not only are we seeing this, but we're also seeing this need for understanding the difference between access to digital technologies and participation with them. So simply having access to the internet doesn't mean that you're going to be literate. You have to learn how to participate. And you have to be empowered to be a, a particip participant. So when I talk about literacy, I very often bring in the digital focus because literacy itself is changing. That means we have to go back to what we know about human development and learning because we cannot rely on the research that's been done 50 years ago or 100 years ago in order to understand what's happening in the brain these days. We also have to understand that literacy has always been about communication, written communication in the context of what society demands of us. We have in Georgia a head start on all of this because of the Get Georgia Reading campaign. Um, Ariane Weldon is in the audience. Um, she's the executive director for the campaign, and that's given us a four-pillar framework for action. And what I'm going to talk to you most about today is language nutrition, but notice when I also talk about our systems for support, we're going to be thinking about access to all of the support systems that we need. We're going to be thinking about what it means to have a positive learning climate in schools and what it means to have a positive learning climate in a classroom as well as in a community, because we do need that. And then finally, um, You'll, I'll, you'll see what I'm talking about when I talk about teacher preparation and teacher learning, teacher development. So as I go through this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring you up like a baby, okay? I'm just going to very briefly go through what it means to become human, a literate human. From the time a baby's born, a, t a baby is learning to become literate, probably even before that because of the whole sound, ability to understand sound. But we can watch this. We can watch this develop. And if we can watch it develop, we can catch it if there's something that is atypical. And if there's something that's atypical, we can intervene early without any kind of label, without, with a very, very quick mechanism, and we can see if that works. And if that doesn't work, we can intervene more, and we can intervene more. But the earlier we catch it, that Understanding that typical development, wellness, is the key. And if we monitor that typical development and catch things early, we don't have to do the remediation that we do today. So as early as, as um, a baby is born and into their baby years, they immediately make eye contact with their caregiver. That's a really important thing because that tells me that that baby is ready to emotionally engage with a caring adult. That emotional engagement, we call that base, your, from their basic affiliative need, um, B-A-N, their ban. <laughs> um, their basic affiliative need then, within the next few months and years, will translate to affiliations with other objects that the caregiver espouses. So if the caregiver likes music a lot, the toddler will like music a lot. If the caregiver likes books a lot, the toddler will realize that books equal caring equals the caregiver. So this connection, because of what we see from eye contact, from tracking facial features, the connection that is grown between the baby and the caregiver will then translate to the third, level, the third object of literacy. Um, we like it when a baby vocalizes in response to a caregiver's voice because that tells me that the baby is, is doing the feed and response. That's the beginning of meaning making. And what is comprehension? It's meaning making. So if you, this is kind of fun, if you have any babies around, you do this experiment, we do this with babies, you just go like this. And as early as three months, they'll do it back to you. They'll do it back. And, and they can't even smile yet sometimes, but they'll, so um, that feed and response behavior is what's going to feed their um, meaning making as they start to engage with text. Because what is text? But it's the feed and response of language, of printed text. So we want to see this develop early. If it's not developing early, we can catch it early, we can get it in place, and then there is no need to remediate. As they grow into toddlerhood, we love to see a, a child start to respond to cues with social gaze. So when you have a room full of toddlers and you have adults walk into the room, 
the toddlers will actually turn and look at the adults. Or if you have, uh, and they'll watch. And a social gaze is a very relaxed gaze that they'll just engage with the adults. They'll immediately look at the eye. They're not looking at the legs or the shoulders. They're actually looking at the face, looking at the eyes, and they're engaging with that adult. Um, they'll start to pair nonverbal and verbal communication cues. So you'll see them do the gestures. Um, that's the beginning of language interactions. You'll see them waving their hands, shaking their heads. That's all exciting things because the gestures that we do are early symbols. And what is print but an abstract symbol? So we want to see them start to engage with that symbolic knowledge development. They start to use ritualized words. They're echoing what you say, and they're figuring out when to say it. So uh-oh or bye-bye. They'll start to use it but confuse it and say it at the wrong time. And then you'll go, oh. Oh, no, he's, you know, only when they go bye-bye. And they start to use it more regularly at the right time. That is the beginning, again, of the social cueing system that we want them to develop. In preschool, they start to understand and use combinations of words, subjects and verbs. You can actually start to teach subjects and verbs as early as preschool. Um, that's an exciting thing because they're starting to understand language structure. They're starting to understand what it means to have a subject and a verb come together to show action. They're also starting to identify pictorial labels. So that's why many of our preschool and toddler books have the pictures with the, with the um, word underneath because they can point to the picture and say the word and they'll be able to read a book that way. Um, those simple emotions that they can express, we can start to lay the language over that because ultimately, remember, literacy is social. Literacy is communication. By pre-kindergarten, kindergarten, and first grade, if you were a teacher in the room, you know these are the magical years for typical development. I can't tell you how many teachers I know who would say, I would not teach any other grade but kindergarten or first grade because that's when kids learn how to read. And what's so funny is that they've been learning how to read before that. We just didn't call it reading. We, we, we can call it conventional reading, but we can't, we can't say they haven't been learning how to read before that because all of those early skills that they learned were essential to their literacy development. Um, as they get into these early grades, they do start to be able to segment sounds. That's an abstract skill that they can start to do. Um, they can start to express a range of emotions. And again, literacy is communication. Communication is interpersonal. If we don't understand how to express emotions and what emotions do, it's very difficult to communicate. So the, the ability to express your emotions and to pull that together in that social interaction will eventually transfer over to their literate interactions. Um, they're able to engage in short dialogues with peers. This is an excellent example of how their metacognition is developing because they're able to um, focus for a while and able to um, interact on a particular topic for a while before they lose interest. This is, this is one of those, like you watch a kid go through this and they, they're not parallel playing anymore. They're actually interacting with another person, one of their peers. It's actually super exciting. Um, but one of the most important things is that they're relating sound, print, image, and other symbols to meaning. And that convergence across modes between print, symbols, image, all of those things coming together to create meaning will, will reinforce each other. So it's more than the sum of its parts. They're symbiotically related. So the more modalities we can offer the child and then pull in the print literacy, the more likely it is that the child will become conventionally literate. By the primary grades, um, you'll see that children are able to stay engaged in a topic for an extended period of time. They start to balance comments and questions a little bit more. They can initiate and maintain conversations that are sensitive to social cues with their peers. They can incorporate role playing, visualizing events, and other representations in talks, text, and play. And then I want to pull it all together with this last one because they're relating meaning across multiple modalities, text, image, sound, animation, video. They're really able to pull those together. They're able to produce them as well as understand them. This is a developmental milestone, because, especially in an age where we're asking kids to become digitally literate because most of the things that we write in the workplace are not three-paragraph essays. 
We do a lot of videos. We do a lot of real short animations. But we don't write, most jobs do not write long reports. My job does, but most jobs don't. Um, and the shorter the better, you know, these days. We've actually seen the, the length of text actually dissipate over time. So when you think about this in the context of write, written literacies, it actually makes a lot of sense. I want to bring to light what it means to write persuasively. This is one of the tasks that we ask all kids to learn to do. In order to write persuasively, you have to use language to communicate. You have to anticipate what the other is going to need in order for them to believe you. And you have to also um, understand what the other is going to ask if they're questioning your argument. And then you have to lay out the justification for that. That's a really hard thing to do if you have not gone through typical social development, if you don't know how to read someone's social cues, if you haven't learned how to um, engage in an emotional um, activity where you start to lay the language on your emotions. So just in that act of persuasive writing, we're relying a lot on their social and emotional cueing as it's grown over time. And by middle and high school, if any of you have ever lived with a middle and high schooler, you know they truly understand sarcasm. <laughs> they understand irony. They understand other non-literal meanings. We often talk about this as figurative language in literacy, and our English language arts standards include standards all the way through um, about figurative language. It's very difficult to understand figurative language, sarcasm, if you don't understand what someone else might be thinking and then you're not actually meaning that, and it's funny because they realize that you don't mean that, that's a back and forth understanding of social understandings. You have to have a concept of another person's mind in a very big way, and then you also have to understand that that's funny. It might not be. Um, but that's, that's how our teenagers have developed over time. In order to understand their literate text, they're gonna have to have developed all of those emotional and social cues. They have to be able to solve problem at problems and be goal-oriented. This is very much a metacognitive ability. So they have to have the ability, executive function ability, to stay focused. And when they start to veer off, they can go, nope, I'm going to come back here. Now remember I said in um, primary grades or even as early as preschool, they start to um, hold their focus in a conversation for a while. Well, if that hasn't happened, if they aren't able to hold a conversation for a while, by the time they're in middle and high grades, it gets really hard to refocus oneself. So as we go through this process and develop their metacognitive understanding, their executive functioning, that actually helps them continue that as they get to, to high school. Um, this, this is the group that is just amazing with digital literacies and digital technologies because they're integrating and synthesizing meaning um, across color, text, image, sound, and print. And so that ability to synthesize across media is going to be exceptionally important for them when they get into college. Now my oldest is 20, he's at UGA, and I've asked him, how many essays have you been asked to write? And he said, None. And I said, how many videos have you been asked to make? And I, was, I don't know, maybe 15, 20. So in schools, sometimes we have high school teachers who think I have to teach them how to write the five paragraph essay because that's what they're going to be asked to do in college. But that's actually not the case. More and more colleges are understanding that in order to be digitally literate for the society that we, were, we are preparing them to participate in, writing a five paragraph essay is not the end goal. We're preparing them to be literate for life. So now I want to tell you a little bit about what Georgia's landscape looks like. How are we doing when we have to think about this? So remember I talked about OECD. Um, these are our PISA results. The US is a little below average in math. We're a little above average in reading, a little above average in science. As a scientist, I look at this and I say, there's really no difference. It's a flat line for reading and science. We're generally average. How many Americans think they're average? Um, so this is a little disturbing. And at, at the same time, I'm thinking, huh, what's going on there? Um, if I look at our National Assessment of Educational Progress, that's, the, that's an assessment that's done every other year. It's a sampling 
of our students in each state. And here you can see Georgia is about average. Georgia is performing at about average. What's exciting to me with, with this outcome, though, because being average is not exciting to me, um, what's exciting to me about this outcome, and this is a study that was done by the Urban Institute in 2016 using the 2015 NAEP outcomes, is that Georgia is outperforming poverty. So the blue dot, the light blue dot, is where we performed on our NAEP. And the dark blue dot is where we performed if you take into account poverty. So we outperformed the forecasted outcome based on poverty. And notice not many other states have done that. Hallelujah. Good job, Georgia. What are we doing right? These are our fourth grade outcomes on the NAEP for, um, for the last 12 years. It does include the latest ones that were announced on Monday. And we did have a bit of a drop on Monday. It's not statistically significant. And there was a bit of a drop nationally. But overall, you can see that the general trend is up and to the right. Hallelujah. Good job, Georgia, right? That means that we've moved from the bottom of the pack across all the states 12, 12 years ago to the middle of the pack. So none of us are OK with being average. If we were to continue on this growth trajectory, and the nation was to continue on their growth trajectory, just hypothetically, it would take us till 2031 to beat the national average. That means that we would have kids come into school this year and graduate, and we're still average. We have to get better, and we have to get better faster. This is the biggest obstacle that we have in Georgia. It's poverty. Our outcomes related to literacy are almost 70% correlated to poverty. So at the bottom of the graph on the x-axis, that is um, the, the level of uh, poverty. And the y-axis is how they did on miles, milestones. And so you can see that they did better when there's less poverty, and they did worse when there's more poverty. So 70% correlation means that if you told me the poverty level, I can tell you without knowing what school they go to, without knowing what programs they implemented, without knowing what teacher they had, with 70% accuracy what their literacy outcomes are in the milestones test. What's going on? We've got to get better faster. Here's another issue with Georgia. We're more poor than other states in the nation. So when we look at our state in comparison to other states, say like Massachusetts, because Massachusetts is often held up as a great example, their poverty level is a little over 30%. When we look at our students in our schools, our poverty level is 62% in our public schools. 62%, and that's done, that's the statistics that's laid out by the Annie E. Casey Foundation from the 2015 census. So we've got to get better faster, and we've got to pay attention to poverty. Because there are things that happen in an impoverished community that happen very early on with social and emotional development that we can intervene in quickly before they ever even get to schools. And then when they get to schools, we can continue to intervene in a way that is sensitive to the needs of that community. These are our um, CRCT and milestones outcomes in relation, this is 2016 data, um, so they're milestones in relation to our economically disadvantaged numbers, and you can see it's almost an identical map. So now I want to tell you that there's hope. <laughs> We actually know what to do. We can't throw a million dollars at a community and be like, OK, go for it. Look, all your kids know how to read now. Instead, it's going to take some very intentional actions in order to get over this hump in Georgia. Remember, we're growing at a rate that's unprecedented. We are beating poverty, but we have to get better faster. So we are so lucky to have the Get Georgia Reading campaign because it pulls together all of the systems in place. We also have several other folks here in the audience. The Literacy Commission is really working to um, create more coherence at the community level. We have the Sandra Dugan Deal, Dungan Deal Center um, 
here, they're trying to help us with the teacher professional development and trying to really focus on school level improvements with, within coordinated activities in the, in the um, community. We have so many wonderful partners that are working together. Um, the Cox Campus and, and the Rollins Center here at the Speech Center, uh, the Speech and Language, I'm sorry, the Atlanta, I'm talking too fast, um, the Atlanta Speech School. Um, <laughs> Is, it's ironic that I got that messed up. Um, the, is we're all working together, and the wonderful thing is that we're goal-oriented on what's going to be best for children. At the Department of Education, we've really started to coordinate this through our L Literacy for Learning, Living, and Leading project, which is not really a project as much as it is a movement, because we're coordinating with all of these other entities, and we have national entities that inform us all the time of research and evidence-based practices. So we're working with the Regional Education Lab from Florida State University. We're working with the American Institutes of Research. We're working with the U.S. Department of Education and the What Works Clearinghouse. We also have a good partnership with the Pentagon, actually, um, and their Advanced Distributed Learning Lab so that we can coordinate online professional learning in a way that is innovative and just amazing so much that the Pentagon has asked us to help them help, help um, our, our soldiers and our veterans. Um, we're also working with the National Science Foundation, who's been very generous with us. Um, the National Writing Project also has wonderful evidence-based programs, and we have four National Writing Project sites here in Georgia. And then we have Georgia's P20 Literacy Think Tank, which includes our regional educational service agencies, as well as our um, teacher preparation programs, coming together. Our literacy professors are coming together to say, what can we do to better serve kids? So we coordinate a lot of organizations and entities trying to get them child-focused, data-driven, and moving towards steps for improvement. What that looks like from a child's perspective is that when, they're, when a family is born and it has a child and they're born here in Georgia, they have a series of services that are available to them. These are services that we already pay for. You are taxpayers here in Georgia and you don't have to pay for something new. We have to coordinate these services better. So if a child's born here, there are all sorts of screeners and opportunities that are provided by the Georgia Department of Public Health. They can go into, when, when a child's born, their maternal um, nurse, the nurse who helps them um, with giving birth, that nurse is learning how to engage uh, the mother and the father so that they learn how to talk with their baby. Because just those language interactions, those early language interactions will help with our literacy numbers. They can find a quality rated child care center that's been, that's been documented by the Department of Early Care and Learning as a high quality child care center. And we ha we've, we've gone through rigorous processes to get those in place. And if they don't have one in their community, they can reach out through their, um, through their liaisons in their community and we can try to start one there. Um, we have the Georgia Head Start Association and, and the um, special preschool special education program at the Georgia Department of Education. So when we, notif when we learn that a child has a need for any of these interventions, we can immediately serve these children. And we've got to get more children into this process so that we can serve them earlier on. We also have two organizations that provide speech and language services. Now, speech and language pathologists, if you're in the room, thank you. <laughs> Um, what we're finding is that many of those social and emotional cueing systems and communication systems that we can intervene on early will benefit their literacy, and many of the interventions are actually literacy interventions. So narrative book reading and narrative storytelling is one of the interventions that you might do use in a speech-language therapy session, and that not only builds their oral communicative ability, but it also builds their print literacy. And then when they get to the Georgia Department of Education, we intake kids with a series of screeners and assessments. One of the main screeners that we have is Form 3300. This is a screener that every kid in Georgia has to do, or has to turn in when they enter into kindergarten. And it is looking at their vision, their hearing, their oral health, and their nutrition. And what we find sometimes is that that form is turned in, but it's, it's not looked at after that. But what we have going on in Learn for Life right now, thank you, 
is when we see that a child needs intervention because of vision or hearing, we can immediately provide services to those children. And that will help their reading. Glasses help your reading. It's a simple thing, and yet when we look at poverty in relation to literacy, that's actually a really big thing. Um, hearing aids, any kind of hearing interventions, and then again, our speech language um, therapists are super helpful in all of these therapies and, and um, assistive technologies, I call glasses assistive technology, in helping our children. We also have the G Kids Readiness Check, and starting next year, we will have Keenville. Keenville is a formative assessment. It provides um, literacy and numeracy data around a kid. It's a game, it's a video game. Who doesn't like a video game? The kids have an avatar, they customize their avatar, the avatar moves through a world and does these tasks in order to show, uh, to, to get their avatar to power up, right? As they're doing the tasks, the feedback that they get is helping their learning, so it's assessment for learning. At the same time, it's conducting a report on that, child, that child each time and feeding that to the parent and the teacher. So it's assessment of learning. So when we talk about assessment, we talk about it for learning and of learning. And the more we can do that simultaneously so we don't shut down the learning and start the assessment, the better. So this is, a, again, a very innovative statewide assessment that will be made available starting next year. As they go into the, the school system, um, we have Literacy for Learning, Living, and Leading, which is a coordinated effort around professional development. We have a wonderful relationship with the Cox Campus, which provides online learning, online coaching, as well as the um, Sandra Dungan Deal Center for Early Language and Literacy. We also have our P20 partners. Every district in Georgia has a partnership with the colleges of education near them. Not only that, but the colleges of education are evaluated based on the performance of their local schools. That's called the TPPEM, the Teacher Preparation Program Evaluation Measure. So if I'm at Georgia State University and my school districts aren't doing very well, I'm gonna have to go in and say, how can I help? That's a good thing because we need everybody focused on the right thing, which is doing the right thing for kids. These bottom things, we talk about this as the tiered supports. Um, these bottom things should be in place in every school. School climate ratings, uh, we have a five-star school climate rating system. Every school has to be rated by their parents, by the staff, and by the students and they get a rating for that. And it's also based on attendance, it's based on their suspension rates. And from that rating, we can say, okay, how are you doing? Because we know that that climate rating is significantly correlated to their literacy outcomes. So what you guys saw in the video going on there where they were interacting with kids in a healthy, friendly way, that's gonna up their climate level and that will also feed their literacy um, their literacy levels because literacy is social. If we find that from these, from these um, tier one interventions, these general everybody gets it intervention, we find that that's not working, we should be moving up the, tier, the targeted intervention scale to intervene with speech language services, with our school nurses, our school nurses are great advocates, and then we have what's called the early intervention program. Early intervention provides additional funds for schools. That it is unlimited, um, so we can, we can put as many kids into early intervention as needed, um, and it's for grades kindergarten through fifth grade, and we see, it ha we see that actually working. We can look at the macro level data. Some people say, well, it's just a way to get money into schools. I'm like, if you need money into schools in order to teach them how to read, put money into schools. And they're like, oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> So that actually is working, and we have the data that shows that it does. Um, and then the special education process is a referral, identification, referral, and dismissal process. And that's really important that we maintain that it's a dismissal process as well as a referral process. Because we can see kids who inter get intervention through special education, and we can actually, the sooner we do it, the sooner we can get them out of special education. 
So what's the role of DOE in this system? Well, um, how many of you guys read the book Good to Great? Oh, good. Okay. So Jim Collins wrote Good to Great. He made it a bestseller in the New York Times, Stanford University, like they do, said, come here, be a professor here. And so he went, he worked at Stanford University, and he met another professor, and as we professors will do, someone came up to him and he challenged him, and he said, Jim, you don't know anything. And Jim said, what do you mean I don't know anything? He said, that whole good to great thing, that we'll compete and we'll look at the data and, and then we'll beat you, that doesn't work in the social sector. And Jim Collins tells a story, he's like, what do you mean? And he ended up befriending this man and he learned that in the social sector we cannot compete because our outcome is the same outcome. Your outcome here is to make kids perform better my outcome is to make kids perform better. So the more we work in collaborative coordination, the better your outcome will be and the better my outcome will be. So Jim Collins went back and he wrote an addendum. And not many people have read this addendum, but I have because I read a lot. Um, it's really thin. It's about the size of my pinky. And it's called Good to Great and the Social Sector. And it's all about how to use the Good to Great data-driven mentality in the social sector so that we're not competing and eating our own, we're actually coordinating our efforts. And so what does this mean for the DOE? We are trying to move from a compliance mentality to a service and support mentality. This is very important because the Department of Education for many years has been the compliance organization. Accountability, testing, Make sure that they get tested at this time, make sure your data is clean, make sure you're turning it in, and then you might get your data back in six months. <laughs> you know it's true, I know it's true. <laughs> there are some things we can't change, so I'll say that, that's the caveat, but we really want to, and we are moving in that direction. Under State School Superintendent Richard Woods, we've reduced the number of tests by 50%, the number of state mandated tests. So you might have some tests going on in your schools. Ask, are they state mandated or are they locally mandated? That is a significant reduction. At the same time, we're really trying to encourage schools to think more strategically about their use of federal funds. Because in the past, federal funds, if you were Title I, you had to be spent this way, Title II this way, Title III this way. What we're trying to do is create a consolidated effort for all the federal funds, look at your data, figure out your strategy, thanks Jim Collins, and then work together and use your title funds in that way. So we've been working for a year and a half now with a consolidated title fund pilot and now with all of our local education agency, all the district plans and all the school plans, they can actually use their title funds for things that they never thought they could before. It, you, they used to say, oh, we can't use title funds. He used to say, we can't use title funds for anything but ELA and math. And I said, no, that's not true, because this federal guidance here says you can use it for arts integrated learning. And they said, no, you can't. Well, what we found out <laughs> yay, was that there was something, there was a, a, a chart in the, account of, in the accounting tool that didn't have a, a box to check for arts integrated learning. And I was like, why is anybody using it for arts integrated learning? We know that works, we've got the data. There, it's not a box there. So we have a box there. We're actually redoing that whole account accounting tool. Um, so it's things like that. When we know there's evidence for, we have to make it possible. And it just wasn't imagined as a possibility before. So in the Department of Education now, we're, we're listening and we're trying to create services and supports so that when we lay out expectations, like we're gonna get better faster, and we have accountability, yes, we still have some tests in place, and yes, we still have to turn in data. We have the services in place that get you from here to there. And we're focusing on the whole child. In our latest um, uh, big national push, many of you have heard of No Child Left Behind. Not many of you have probably heard of the Every Ch Student Succeeds Act, or ESSA. Our Georgia ESSA plan has a focus on the whole child. Believe it or not, this was bipartisanly um, praised because we realized that learning is not just cognitive. In research, we call it non-cognitive. In real life, you might call it soft skills. In education, you might call it social and emotional learning. But we're all talking about the same thing. There's no delineation in our brain 
between emotion and logic. It's actually quite coordinated, and we can't get from one to the other without really understanding how that works. So we're focusing holistically on the whole child, and that allows for schools to pull down their funds and to engage in strategies that more readily address learner-centered needs. And we're building networks. So I'm a true believer in that um, if you have the network to do it, you can get it done. And Lord knows we have a network here in Georgia. And I cannot tell you, I, I tell people, yeah, I get really nervous about talks like this. And I was watching people come in the room, and I'm like, I love them. I love them. Oh, I shouldn't be nervous at all. This is a room full of love. And that's how, that's how I feel about our network. It really is that, that loving care that helps us hold the bird in the hand. Um, and so we are building networks. We're building it face-to-face -face through face-to-face -face relationships, and we're also building the online capacity because Georgia is a big state. We're not always in, com in proximity to the people we love. And so we're building our online networks to support that as well. Now, finally, we need you. Because while I've explained the amazing parts of our system, there is a crack in everything. I'm not saying it's a perfect system. What I'm saying is it exists. We've been growing for 10 years. We're beating poverty. We have to get better faster. And we don't have to get better in spite of the system. We actually have to support the system that's actually created that growth. A lot has been put, has been put on the backs of our teachers. Teachers are learning all sorts of things about how to work with toxic stress. They're learning how to teach reading. Um, they're learning all these things. It can't just be one person. It needs to be all of us. So we can all look for the cracks in the system, and then we can help it because that's how the light gets in. And if you think about light the way I do, you think that's the love, that's the network, that's what our kids grow on. So the four pillars do help us when we talk about this. We have, out of 159 counties, we have 58, 60, 74 Get Georgia Reading communities that are using these pillars as a framework for action. That gets everybody oriented. Getting people oriented is like the most important thing before you get them moving. Because otherwise they, send, they tend to disperse and you're like, no, no, come back. So um, get them oriented around these pillars. And then as they get oriented, we have to engage them with understanding what systems are in place. What are the factors that affect a child's ability to read? We know that. How do you connect and support decision makers? We know how to do that. And who are the decision makers in a community? We know how to use data. Let's try to get them to do that. We know how to inspire collective action and innovation. And we can celebrate our partner's successes. That's actually probably the best first step because every community has somebody who's a champion. Every community has some success to celebrate. And everybody wants to come to a party, especially if there's cake. So um, I love this picture of Rosie the Riveter <laughs> because it shows that everybody has a part in this, even our children. In fact, our children, as you can see from some of the marches that children have engaged in most recently, our children are growing up in an, in an environment where we can empower them to have voice. I talked about how literacy is changing and how production and empowerment are more of a, a need now more than ever. We have a digital environment. We have a digital society. Everybody has a voice, and sometimes the voices that are being listened to aren't necessarily the ones that your children need. <laughs> and so as we develop this, engage the children in all of this, because they have a voice in it, and they want to engage. And at every level of development, they have something to offer. So um, I, do ha I do have a survey for you. And if you want to fill out the survey, please do. And I can also send this out through the Atlanta Speech School. Um, because one of the things that I did when I first came into the Department of Education was I said, we're going to look at our own data. And we're going to engage in continuous improvement. And so I'm engaged in continuous improvement myself. I'm constantly looking at how I do my talks. And my whole team does this as well. So please. Um, Give your feedback here, and I'm happy to answer questions for a few minutes. That's OK. <laughs> yes, ma'am.
Yeah. Yeah. Good question. So the question was, um, is technology teaching our kids, and is that okay? And and should teachers teach or how, how could teachers use it effectively? Great question. So um, what we find when we put technology in front of a child and we remove the teacher from that is that um, kids who would have persisted in a teacher-focused class continue to persist. And this is after grade six because the research is not strong before grade six, and I'll talk about what that looks like. Um, but the kids who would persist will continue to persist. And so we actually see excellent outcomes from online courses. Um, when you have a full school, as a digital school, and the, and the teacher for every class is removed from that, kids don't persist. So there is some level of engagement with online education that a child will engage with and do better, but when you remove the caring adult altogether, they won't persist because teaching is ultimately a relational thing. And so if a child was, um, if a child's put in, in front of a, a computer and they have a, they have a affinity for an adult outside of that, they'll probably be okay. But for our kids who wouldn't have persisted with the teacher, they're less likely to persist with the computer in front of them. Um, and that is our, that's our most vulnerable population anyway. So it kind of helps it, it makes the rich richer, but it doesn't necessarily help our most vulnerable populations. Um, what I always recommend is that you use technology as a tool, just like you use textbooks as a tool. We would never put a textbook in front of a child and say, here you go, that's calculus, right? <laughs> so technology is a very effective tool. It's probably more effective than a textbook, but teaching is a relational thing. You're, they're, telling, they're telling you through their interactions, I don't get it, I do get it. Any teacher in this room knows what I don't get it looks like. It looks like, or it looks like I'm going to go to the bathroom, <laughs> or it looks like acting out, right? So the teacher is able to pick that up. Computers don't pick up those social cues at all. So for many children, having, um, having the relationship is super important. At the same time, I want to say, um, for a teacher, if they get a good, a, a good technological tool available to them, they can often use it as a curricular resource in a way that allows them to not have to write curriculum. So for example, we have some very strong curricular content. Um, you know, I'm, I sit over at Georgia Virtual School, so we have some courses. Georgia Virtual School is not a school. We don't have a graduating class. It's a supplementary course provider for kids in schools. What we find is that the kids who um, enter into our Georgia virtual classes often outperform the kids who are sitting in our regular classrooms. And we think it's because the content that's provided in there is very strong. Now I will say though, the caveat there is that those are the kids who persisted. So we, when, we find, when we look at that population, we can see that there's some sample bias and what I always recommend to a school system, because it's often used in rural areas because they don't have an AP physics teacher, or they don't have, you know, a, we, a, I'm trying to think of what, oh, human geography is a very common, um, popular course. And, you know, they, ha they have other needs for the teachers that they have in their local community in our rurals, um, but they don't, if, if this is a course that we can do online, let's do this course online and then let's have the teacher teach these other courses. We have a big attrition issue in, in Georgia. We have a retention and attrition issue, especially in our rural districts. Um, and so having those virtual um, courses available are helpful. But what we don't see is high quality performance in our virtual schools. So when we offer all of the courses in a virtual environment, we have a huge attrition rate, we have lack of persistence, and we have lack of performance. Yes. Next fall, it'll be in pilot, um, so you have my card. And so um, email me and I'll make sure you're part of the pilot because they want more pilot places. Um, we're bas it's basically by volunteer. Yes? Hi, um, I wanted to get your opinion to see what do you believe that um, school leaders can do to 
cultivate whether this environment such as the ones that have been featured this evening or in our early opportunity video? Yeah. Like, what are some best practices that you've seen or suggestions for solutions? Great question. So, um, so the first thing I always recommend to leaders is that they look at their data because they may actually have a language-rich environment and not realize it. So they might need to just praise the teachers for having it. If they look at their data and they're finding that it's not there, and I could say the first piece of data I would look at when I think about that is our climate data. And they can look and see, how's our climate data doing? Because in a language-rich environment, you're gonna find that the social interactions are healthy and that when you have the items like, I feel safe in this school, or I, you know, I, I can't think of some of the other ones. Um, I feel safe in the school is the most, um, is the item in the climate survey in elementary that's most predictive of our literacy outcomes. Isn't that crazy? And it's, and I think it really does have to do with the, you saw it in the, in the video with the child saying, I feel safe, I like Mr., I can't remember his name, Mr. Parker, yeah. That is. So yeah, so we can look at those, we can look at the data and say, wow, more kids are feeling safe. And we'll see the numbers for literacy rise with that. Um, so I would look at the data first. The next thing I would do is talk about why, because I think sometimes in schools, um, we put in a new program or we put in a new initiative and we forget the big why. For me, the why is always children. Um, but saying we're doing it for the children is not often the most, but if you can show that, core, that um, relationship between language development and literacy development, that's a very direct correlation. Um, almost a, a, so the highest correlation you can get is one, and it's like for most of our studies, it's close to one. The only thing that, the only factor that um, disrupts that is the child's ability to decode, which we, we know how to work on. Um, but language is the hardest thing to move. So after we start talking about the, the reason for upping the level of language, then we can start talking about how. And many of our school leaders have not been reading teachers or speech language therapists or um, some of them have been parents. So I always recommend to school leaders at every level, elementary, middle, and high, that they engage their master teachers. Because the teachers are the ones with the extensive pedagogical knowledge. And if they have a bad turnaround issue in their school, which many of our vulnerable populations have an attrition issue in their schools for teacher retention, they don't have that core master teacher, then they can look to their P20 partner. And there's a, there's a college of education there that wants to help their outcomes are based on your kids. And so they can look for that expert in that way. But you want someone, not every leader has the expertise to tell people how to engage in rich language. Those tier two words, I'm looking at you because you're like, yeah, tier two words and you know, expansions and extensions and you know, tell me more kinds of questions. Not everybody knows how to do that. Um, and the master teachers then can help the other teachers. So really distributed leadership is gonna be key. Sure. So I really appreciated your, um, first of all, I love your talk, um, but I really appreciated your explanation of how you changed the checkbox to allow Title IX to be um, nationally. There's a lot of um, guidance that Title I funds can also be used for early learning. And based on your presentation, there's so much emphasis in early learning. But Georgia has generally been very restrictive about how Title I funds can be used for early learning. So I wondered if there's any um, way to have any movement there. Yes, it is. <laughs> that up. So, um, so as school districts are pulling down their title funds, they have to look at their data. And for the first time, when we just, we won a $61.5 million grant for our state. It was the biggest grant in the whole nation, and it was um, the highest rated. I had something to do with the writing. Um, in the whole nation, and it's for the L4GA grant. Okay, so we're, that is basically the model that we're, we're using. 
schools have to look at their data. They have to not only look at their data, but they have to look at their data in the context of their community. And then as they look at their data, they then have to look at what are the strategic interventions that we can use in order to pull down, in, in order to make a difference. Then when they put their funding toward that, whether it's state, federal, or local, they're supposed to use their funding in that strategic way. Well, we can't make every school district do that in our local communities because your local tax office isn't going to do that. But we can with our federal programs. So every district has to go through this continuous improvement process. And every district is looking at their data strategically. And then through the whole child efforts, every district then has all of these different strategies in front of them, not just doubling down on ELA and math. They can put it toward early learning. They can put it toward after school. They can put it toward arts integrated. They can put it toward getting digitally um, connected, um, although that's been happening with E-rate e stuff, so we can help. But there are so many things that they can do now that they could have never done before. There's still regulations in place, so we're still, you know, we got to walk the walk sometimes. But we have opened that up in a big way. Now the risk here with flexibility is always equity. So one of the one of the critiques of the flexi of the local flexibility movement has been well how do we ensure equity? Because that's why the feds put in place all the all the boundaries that they put. So when I talk about this with school leaders and with with um, district leaders I say you have to, it's your responsibility to maintain that balance. It's your responsibility to ensure that you're looking at your subgroup differences and any kind, anytime you see those subgroup differences, it's your responsibility to take care of them through your strategy because they're still required to look at those, those differences and make sure that they're serving all kids. So I hope that answers your question. And then also they are starting to think of their data longitudinally. Thank you, Ariane, for um, helping us think about population level movement. So they're starting to think about what are the, who are the kids who are coming into our schools? What are their services provided for birth through five before they ever get here? And then we're helping them with the transition. We do have, a, we now have a shared position with DECAL for, um, for uh, school climate. So we're, we actually work, I work a lot with DECAL, but we actually have now have somebody who's literally like a shared position. She goes back and forth between the two of us, making sure that we're all on the same page. You had one more question. And you had such a wonderful um, introduction there with all, with, with the whole language thing. Yeah. And, and I loved it. But um, you talk about poverty and you talk about parents that, you know, are either trying to get jobs, trying to work, they don't single parent family. family. Yeah. When do they do those kinds of things and how do they get educated to do those kinds he of says, things? He says, though I plan to do it, I question. <laughs> okay, so on the tables as you walk out and then also um, you'll get an email, if you've been here, you'll get this email with some PDFs attached. So you'll have access to all of these things, whether you want a print copy or you just want the PDF, because I don't like a bunch of print. Um, so parents have access to this Ready 4K um, which is a text messaging system that they can opt into. Ready 4K is free. They opt into it. They get three texts a week, one with a tip, one with a fact, and one with a why. And it's tips as simple as while you're giving a bath, look at the shampoo bottle and point out the valves. Or when you're driving, clap while you're singing a song to the radio. That helps with sound segmentation. Things like that are super easy. They can be done during transitional times. Anybody can get this and it's all free. It's called Ready for K. It's available in English and Spanish. We also have Words to Reading. Words to Reading um, was developed in partnership with um, the Governor's Office of Student Achievement. It has a list of all of the different services as well as a whole bunch of free um, online books that parents can download or even look at on their digital devices. Um, and, and then it also has connections to other community organizations where they can get services. If any of you are wondering what a digital text looks like today in schools, this is one that I'm super proud of because we made it um, in partnership with uh, Georgia Public Broadcasting. It's all about the civil rights movement. We have many elders here in Atlanta who are instrumental in the civil rights movement and many of them are getting 
little bit older, and so we've interviewed all of them, and we have primary source documents with newspapers, music, art. So talk about arts integrated learning, but that's, this is the real stuff. This is what we're, how we're teaching social studies these days. So you'll have these and you can look at it. I've, I've actually given these out at my church too because everybody's like, that's so cool. Um, this, is, this is a learning tool, but it's also just a way cool example of what digital texts might look like. Um, the thing that I am super proud of to give out is this. It's a service map. So um, if, you ha if you know of a family that needs any of these services, it literally has a flow chart, getting health insurance. How do you get health insurance in, in Georgia if you're poor? Well, this is how. How do, you get a, how do you get access to a doctor? This is how. So it's literally just a simple, easy to read service map about how to access our levels of care that are available to everybody. You'll have that. And then um, for those of you who are working in schools or in um, early child care settings, you have this. This is the red flags, um, assessments and interventions that you can put in place for social and emotional learning. Um, many of the speech language therapists will recognize many of these therapies that are available, but this is also available to any of you. And then finally, or not finally, um, for those of you who are working in school districts and you need to use evidence-based practices, you know what I'm talking about when I say that? So you need to use research-based practices. This is, a, um, this is a, a relatively brief, I do tend to write too long, but it's about 23 pages of um, evidence-based practices in relation to literacy, including community coalition building um, and including some of the community level activities that you can do. And then finally, this is the Get Georgia Reading Campaign Community booklet, which I love because it has this. Um, this is a map of what it looks like for a child to grow up as a literate being here in Georgia and all of the things that have to happen. And if we miss a mark here, we need to intervene early because by the time they're in third grade, it's too late. It's not too late to remediate, but we're trying not to remediate. It's too late for them to, to develop typically because we've got to pass that hurdle. So again, all of these are available to you and you'll get PDFs of all of them as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, Dr. Bigley, thank you for presenting and I'm so grateful for your service. If you do want to join us, you're in the other founding every opportunity schools as part of Learn for Life and as part of supporting Dr. Dooley's work, you can also sign up at